uh, 080T. Can you cut that out, please? He, sa- he says he will. Thank you. You're a good robot. You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Buenas noches. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 2, page 60. Nice. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I am another one of your hosts, Big Anklevich. And our last host is over here in the corner. His name is R080T. But we don't have time to introduce him this week, so we'll go right on to our story, which is Framing and Mounting Fairies by Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson has published 60 or so stories over the past few years in markets like Dark Animus, Darkness Rising, Dark Wisdom, well, a lot of publications with the word dark in the title, which is a little misleading because he's really not a dark guy. He lives in sunny Southern California with his wife, children, and a turtle named Chalky, or Rock, depending on which kid you ask. In the last year, his stories have been produced in audio on fiction podcasts like Pseudopod, The Drabblecast, Well Told Tales, and, by the end of 2008, Sniplets. Currently, he is seeking an agent for a YA novel and looking for a publisher for a collection. Website, www.kevin-anderson.net. Framing and Mounting Fairies by Kevin Anderson. The following article first appeared in Creating with Nature magazine, August 1996. Framing and Mounting Fairies, Fun for the Whole Family, by Dr. Morgan Z. Vile. So, you have captured a fairy, properly smothered it in a jar laced with alcohol, and are now wondering what to do next. Why not share that trophy with friends and loved ones? by preserving your prize in a beautiful display case or frame. Mounting fairies can be fun for the whole family, not to mention highly sought after decorative centerpieces. Decorating guru Philip Yen says, mounted fairies are the perfect accent in any eclectic or feng shui decor. But even Joe Sixpack can enjoy a fine display of mounted fairies because preparing their bodies for viewing is a hobby that the whole family can get in on. My children and I have been hunting and framing tiny folk for almost 20 years, and it's a pastime that has helped us bond in ways I haven't been able to describe in over a dozen how-to books. Available at Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and Borders.com. Now what you will need to gather before unscrewing that jar are the following. An assortment of stick pins, tweezers, rubber gloves, mounting board, the best kind are fashioned from balsa wood or styrofoam, several pieces of paper, cotton balls, weights or clamps, and embalming aerosol. Not legal in California, but available in a pump bottle. All these items can be acquired at your better hobby stores. Step one, before unscrewing that lid, place cotton balls firmly in your ears. Fairies emit a series of high-pitched screams whilst in their death throes, which do dissipate but more times than not are still held captive within the jar. Direct exposure to these high tones of anguish can cause erectile dysfunction, evacuation of the bowels, and promote allergies. If you have a dog, you may wish to put him outside. Step two, open the jar. After waiting a good five minutes for the death screams to dissipate, reach in with fingers or tweezers and retrieve your fairy carcass. Lay your prize face down on the beveled out section of your mounting board. This bevel should be three quarters of an inch wide and half an inch deep. 
it is important to get to this step within 12 hours of death. You are in a race against rigor mortis. Any delay in mounting and preserving your fairy can end with dissatisfying and unsightly results. Step 3. Select your mounting pin and place the tip between the specimen's shoulder blades. Press gently, but firmly. Piercing the back and chest cavity, and emerging through the sternum. Then with caring hands, lift upward on the wings until the impaled body slides up on the pin, becoming level with the mounting board's main surface. Then and only then can you remove the cotton balls from your ears. Very often, residual screams can linger in the lungs and are released when the pin punctures the chest. I went through several pairs of pants before I learned that lesson. Step 4. With a steady hand, spread the wings flat on the board. Upon touching a fairy's wing, you will discover a fine dust will come off on your fingertips. This dust comes from row upon row of tiny scales that cover the wings. It is these scales that make the lovely designs of color and light. But it is these same scales and excreting dust that give the North American skunk fairy its paralyzing odor. Even in death, this noxious creature can have toxic effects. Proper breathing protection can mean the difference between a festive fairy mounting experience and a trip to the emergency room with all your limbs going numb. But let's assume we are dealing with a simple common everyday fairy such as the Bayou Beauty or the New England Swallowtail. Continue on by laying pieces of paper over the wings, using your pins to secure the paper to the board. Careful not to pierce those wings, they are as fragile as toilet paper and can tear at the slightest provocation. Step 5. Take your weights or clamps and secure the board to your desk or work table. Fairies are clever creatures and often find ways to mimic death, even during the piercing. They just wait until you step from the room, then try to flee, taking the mounting board with them. I once stepped out to answer the phone before securing the board and returned to find it spinning in the air like a barn shingle caught in a dust devil. Before I got it under control, I had a busted lamp, a cracked computer monitor, and a very perplexed cat. <coughs> Step 6. Let the rigor mortis do its thing. That's right, you're done for the next 10 to 12 hours. You can spend this time stalking more fairies, or curling up with one of my many how-to books, published by the good people at Triple Servant Press. Step 7. We're almost home now. After a minimum of 10 hours, release the pins holding the paper and you will notice that the wings are permanently spread out, displaying their wealth of beauty. You can now remove the fairy from the board by holding it by the head of the pin used to impale the chest. If you flip the fairy over, glancing at its face, you will notice that the expression frozen on its tiny features during suffocation is not the most pleasant thing to gaze upon. If displayed in this state, it would frighten and disgust children, ah! potential girlfriends, ah! and, speaking from experience here, mother-in-laws. Ah! Now is the perfect time for a bit of what I call molding. Take your tweezers or stick pin and gently nudge the curls of the fairy's mouth from a painful scream to a delightful, sprightly smile. At this stage, the fairy's skin molds like clay and you can sculpt any expression you wish. Experiment, have fun with it. Step eight, put on your rubber gloves, take your embalming aerosol or pump bottle and generously apply the preserving enamel. I like to give it two coats of the high gloss variety with UV protection. This will keep your fairies from fading, chipping, or peeling. Now your prize is ready for framing. 
you can now hang it up on the wall and pat yourself on the back for a job well done. That's all for now, my fellow fairy hunters. And remember, the only good fairy is a mounted fairy. Happy hunting. Footnote. Author's bio. Dr. Morgan Z. Vile killed his first fairy at the age of eight when he discovered a twin-headed Mortimer tormenting his pet hamster. After dispatching the fairy with natural expert abilities, his parents encouraged his interest in fairy hunting and pest control. Vile attended the University of Berkeley, where he earned degrees in xenobiology, cryptozoology, and accounting. With a doctorate from Dartmouth in miniature humanoid anatomy, he is currently the department chair for Otherworld Studies at the University of Bradbury. An author of more than a dozen how-to books, he is probably most known as a founding member of the FHA, Fairy Hunters of America, acting as this powerful lobbying organization's president from 1982 to 1988. He was forced out of office during an FBI sting for suspected violation of the Lewd Conduct with Humanoids Act of 1967. Vile turned state's evidence and received a full pardon from outgoing President Ronald Reagan. His author credits include Mounting Fairies for Fun and Profit, Laparoscopic Taxidermy, Stuffing Miniature Humanoids, and the best-selling how-to book Casting Fairies in Metal, a step-by-step guide to creating necklaces and charms out of fairies, pixies, and other tiny folk. Excerpt from eBay auction number 34567-8870, listed on October 31st of this year. Product description. A true must-have for any collector of surface world trophies. The most wanted human in all the seven realms, Dr. Morgan Z. Vile. Elegantly mounted and displayed. The frame has been handcrafted from drift root by wood elves, and the mounting was executed by well-known taxidermist and gnome Willow Zagarden. Notice how the cause of death has been beautifully concealed by Zagarden, who worked round the clock to stitch up over 700 tiny bite and stab wounds. This display stands over 2 meters tall and will brighten up any forest, gully, or subterranean rumpus room. Winner pays shipping and handling, and must contact the seller within 3 center earth days at the close of auction. Payment accepted in money order, grub nuts, or PayPal. No personal checks. If you have any questions regarding this auction, please email the seller at vengefulwings at yahoo.com. Author's note. 90% of my short stories fall into the horror genre, but every once in a while I get an idea that takes me out of my comfort zone. I don't much like experimental pieces, but the idea of a how-to fantasy piece just seemed to keep growing in the back of my mind. When the publisher of the now-dead World Fantasy Geographic, a publication that died in its second issue, solicited a fiction fantasy article from me, it seemed the perfect time to hammer it out. Using my marketing and copywriting background in the DIY industry as the backbone for the piece, I then called upon my brief but memorable childhood hobby of butterfly and insect collecting to flesh out the details. I'm not really sure why I dabbled in such a hobby as a kid. To be honest, it was a bit sick and twisted, and the memory of the bugs squirming as they died is still kind of unpleasant. I think all boys go through a sadistic phase, and that was mine. When WFG folded, I just put the story in a trunk and forgot about it, not sure where to submit it. I never thought it could work in audio until I heard Michael A. Arnzen's How to Grow a Man-Eating Plant on Pseudopod. It's a straight how-to piece, and Pseudopod pulled it off brilliantly. So I pulled Mounting Fairies out of the trunk, polished it, and gave it the eBay ending just to make it feel more like a story, and sent it into Doonstief. And, well, you know the rest. I hope you liked it. All right, welcome back. Thanks for listening to the story. I hope you enjoyed it. Kevin, thank you for submitting that. Man. That's right. It was a wonderful story. Um, it was as twisted as my life. <laughs> and if you enjoyed that story, or if you didn't enjoy that story, stop on by the website, www.dunstief.com, D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F.com, and leave a comment. I think pretty much all the authors that have, have sent us stories really appreciate hearing whatever it is you got. And another thing that the uh, authors appreciate is that we pay them real money for their story. And uh, the way we get that money is that you go to a job every single day, and I just sit back and wet the bed. But preferably, he's not kidding. There would be donations that are coming in. 
people that just want to leave a couple of bucks to see that that goes to a worthy cause, and that worthy cause would be the writers that are submitting these great stories. And uh, also, one day, I aspire to not have to hold this microphone. <laughs> uh, we got a PayPal link right there on the website. You can click on that. In fact, you can press the button. <laughs> yes, you could press the button. You can do that. Send us anything that you would like. Yeah, so you can you can donate a one time donation where you just you know say hey I'm going to give them five bucks and that's it. I'm never giving them anything else. That's all they're worth. Or you can donate five bucks a month or five bucks a quarter, which is every three months, which is once an issue. Has anybody ever done that? The quarterly, monthly, daily. I don't think so. Oh. So the holidays are upon us. It would be really a nice thing to do to send us a donation. Yeah. We would be honored if you would join us. Hey, uh, the other day you told me that somebody aired our promo on their podcast. Yeah. Can you say aired with a podcast? Anyways, sorry. Um, <laughs> somebody featured our promo? <laughs> well, it doesn't ever go out on the air. Anyways... Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, we've actually had our promo played on a couple of different podcasts, as poorly done as the promo may have been. Maybe someday, someone other than John Smith will actually uh, give it a listen. Well, John, if you're out there and you have a podcast, you might consider putting our promo up there. But how, how would he do that? We have the uh, promos available for download on the website. There's even two to choose from. Just slap it on any podcast you got. We'd love for somebody to know that we exist. Please. Anyways. You know, last podcast, the Uberman one, we were supposed to have talked about the October Scary Story event and, and how that went. We, we didn't quite get to it. Do you remember why? You know, I'll bet it was the robot's fault. Somehow, I've got a feeling that our 080T dropped the ball on that one. Thanks, 080T. <coughs> My guess is uh, that means uh, you're welcome. Wow. Amazing how you can just figure that stuff out. It's, you won't even need the little translator program anymore. You know, Big, you're my little translator program. As gay as that sounds. That's what she said. Mm, you know, I I'm not sure you're doing that right. Oh, that's what she said? Oh, much better. Uh. <laughs> so, hey, let's talk about the October Scary Story event. Basically, it was just not really a contest, but just I invited people to send in stories that they started around October 1st, and, and the deadline was October 31st, just something they wrote during that month, and it had to be scary. And, you know, I, I, I wish I had been more... It's, it's not explicit. It's a word like explicit. Uh, gratuitous? No, no, no. Like, I wish I had put it out there much more clearly uh. that you were supposed to write it within that time. But, but you know what? That's, that's fine. I just, when somebody sends in a story and it was previously published in 1962 in Weird Tales, I kind of get the feeling they didn't write it this October. Yeah. But anyway, it was really cool that we got so many submissions. Yeah, We were reading through them and, uh, well, there weren't a mountain of them, but there were... There was a few. Um, there, there was, was a molehill of them. Yes. Well, we're not going to make a mountain out of that molehill, but we are going to talk about them. Uh... You're mocking me, aren't you? Uh, no, no, never, sir. So there were a few submissions for the uh, October Scary Story event. Um, oh, there was that one where uh, Rish Outfield finally got his comeuppance for his years of bastardry uh, when the normally kind and affectionate robot uh, comes to life and attacks him when he's on the toilet. I, I, I didn't read that one. Oh, that's okay. You will. Wait, well, what does that mean? Then there was that one that was like a total ripoff of The Ring, where this high school kid goes to the school library, and there's this mysterious video, and he watches it, and it's cursed, so that anyone who watches it dies horribly. Dude, I, I, that was actually a pretty good story. I, I liked it, anyway. But I really doubt Gore Verbinski's lawyers would like it. Dude, it was nothing like The Ring. What's on the curse video? The ghost of a murdered librarian. And how do the people who watch it die? Well, they get scared to death, and when somebody finds the bodies, they're all gray and Rick Bakered out. And how do they defeat the curse? They make a duplicate of the video. So how is that not the ring? Well, 
It's a DVD instead of a video cassette. Okay. You've got a point there. I guess when, when you're right, you're right. So there was also that one where it was about the t- kids that come um, trick-or-treating at the house. Oh, oh, that, that, yeah. Uh, I had my niece in the room when I was reading through it, and she came in right when I got to the part where the trick-or-treaters go, trick-or-treat, bloody feet. Oh, uh-huh. And she read that part aloud, and I was like, you know what? You're hired. When we do this actual thing, I'm going to get you to do that. And That'll be good. She, yeah, she, she's really into that kind of sick, twisted stuff. <laughs> I often wonder if she might be my kid. Which is very well, wrong. To you. Oh yeah, there you go. There's the excuse. That I I really dug the one about the the girl that was picked on at school and everybody called her a witch, and so there was like the bully that's mistreating her or whatever. And uh, and well, we learned that this is not a girl you mess with. Right. Yeah, that one was good. And then there was that other one too. Uh, it's kind of based, I think, on that urban legend or whatever it is, where like you go into the bathroom and you chant Bloody Mary or something like that a bunch of times, and then you see the ghost of Bloody Mary in the in the mirror or whatever it is. I think that's how it goes. That's how the that's that's how it was when I was a kid in kindergarten. We we lived in this lived. We went to this old old school that had been there since like the Depression, and they tore it down when I was in fifth grade. But when I was in kindergarten through fourth. Yeah, we, we, it was just old and cold and falling apart. And we would go in this one bathroom and uh, all the tile was really reflective. And they'd say that if you would chant Bloody Mary three times in there, that you would see her reflected in the tile. And yeah, it was one of those things where we would try and do it and freak ourselves out so bad we'd go running out into the hall screaming kind of thing. Yeah, so it's kind of based on that, except for in this one they go to the cemetery and they, they chant. It's just really cool. I liked it a lot. It was nice. Uh, there was also the one uh, where there's the doctor. No, no, not a doctor. The sur- surgeon. The What do you call somebody that operates on dead people? Uh, coroner, right? Or well, I call them mom. But Right, okay. So there's a coroner, and he discovers uh, a way to extract the soul out of dead people and serve it up to people to, to drink. Is that right? I, yeah, okay. I know. Yeah, that one was good. Yeah, it was good stuff. I like that one. Oh, hey, you know which one I really dug on? The the one that ripped out the sixth sense? Hey, instead of Bruce Willis, it was Haley Joel Osment that was dead, okay? So which one did you really like? Okay, so it's the one where the, the kid really wants to see a vagina, right? So he makes this wish, <laughs> and then suddenly he, he starts seeing vaginas everywhere he goes. You know, they're on dogs and, and, and flowers and, and on the moon and on his teacher's forehead. Uh, and, and he starts screaming, no, no, please, no more vaginas, please, I beg of you, hey, no Rick, more Rick, va- Rish. Yeah. Big? What? That was your story, wasn't it? Well, I, I, how could you tell? Did you hear a buzzing sound? Yeah, but it's really soft. Anyway, I really like the one where the guy goes insane and he kills his family for no reason at all, except for some minor annoyance that was going on in his life. Big, that sounds an awful lot like your story. Uh, which one? All of them. Ha ha. Yeah, well, it was a good story. Man, we gotta do something about that buzzing. It's not. Anyway, there was also that one with, with the fat twin and the skinny twin where they decide they're going to switch places. And so the fat one stops eating altogether. And then the skinny one. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Big? Uh, yeah. Where is your family? Oh, uh, they're around. Uh, what, what, what were we talking about? Scary story event. So how do you want to handle this? I figured what we'd do is we'd take the best of these stories and we would uh, maybe once a month we'd do a, a podcast of stories that made the cut and we could start in January and, you know, we could we could even make it like a franchise. We could brand it. We could put like a, a little subtitle. What do you call it? A title that's before the title. Pre-title. I don't know what the heck they call it, but we could do something like that. You know, like like the new X-Men movie where it's going to be X-Men Origins colon Wolverine or the first Avenger colon Captain America. Except for this one, it'll be October scary story event colon and then a, whatever story it is that we're doing. So we do like one a month like that? I, hey, I, I've got a great idea. Yeah? Let's not do that thing with the colon. Uh, semi-colon? Okay. We got a okay. deal. Okay. So we'll keep people updated. 
on that. And thank you for sending in the scary stories. If we're both still alive uh, when October comes around again, maybe we'll do it again. Yeah, that would that would be cool. Even if somebody knocks you off, I may still carry it on in, in your honor. Can you carry something on in honor of someone who never had honor? You're a monster. You know that? <laughs> and I'm going to call the police as soon as we're done. Okay, so I guess that brings us to the end of our pod. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Oh, we almost made it. Wow, do you, do you want to read this? Uh, I think it's your turn, man. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really want to read a, a hate letter this week. You do it, okay? Uh, I really don't want to do it, man. It's Oh, uh, I know. Geez. We'll have 080T read it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think he could read it, really, because people wouldn't really understand unless I translated yeah, the whole I way. But I got, You know, I got an idea. He could pick who could read. He could pick who, who needs to read uh, this week. He's just going to... Oh, look. He says it's your turn. He picked you. That's a, that's a big shock. Okay. Here we go. To Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. I would like to be considered for your hate letter of the week, but I doubt that I'll be chosen. The reason for this is that I think that your hate letters are fakes. My first hint was that all the names were just a little too silly, and my second was that people signed their names at all. Well, maybe they used a pseudonym, you know, a fake name so that... Yeah. I don't know. But the clincher was the one a couple weeks ago where the writer actually created a poem to tell you how stupid you are. Like someone would really sit down and do that. I think the hate letter writers are just made up and that the two of you sit around trying okay. to come up... Okay, just, just, just hold it right there, Mr... Uh, Jones. Mr. Jones. If we were making up fan letters... Wouldn't we come up with complimentary things to say about ourselves and how great we were? Yeah, that sounds pretty logical to me. Y you know what? That's not good enough. I think you're the one that's made up, Mr. Jones. You don't exist. What do you think of that? Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of another podcast. I appreciate you guys listening, for sending in your stories, and uh, keep on trucking. That's right. <laughs> And so, as usual, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm stressing that on the axiom, you will survive. I don't want to survive. I want to live. Good night. And have a pleasant tomorrow. <laughs>The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the file. That's right. Kevin Anderson uh, has written a lot of stories for publications with the word dark in it. That's all right. I've written a lot of stories for publications with the word dork in them. But... <laughs>